I have the privilege to announce our uh, next and final panel of the day. Um, I think one of the great things about the Federalist Society is that we get to have uh, conversations on controversial topics uh, where many of us have strong feelings, and I know I certainly do on this topic, uh, which brings me to our moderator, the Honorable Elizabeth Kerr. Uh, the Justice has been a longtime friend of the Federalist Society, and she began her time on the bench of the Second Court of Appeals in 2017 and was recently reelected by the voters this past November. Justice Kerr received her JD from the University of Texas after receiving her bachelor's in English and art history from Rice. A very accomplished writer, Justice Kerr, served as a contributing editor to the seventh edition of Black's Law Dictionary and has taught legal writing to law students for years, as well as also teaching opinion writing to newly elected appellate judges. And with no further ado, I will turn it over to her. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am, I'm really honored to have been asked to moderate this panel on uh, one of, I think it's fair to say, the, the, the most hotly contested issues of our time, both legally, policy matters, it, uh, all, all across the spectrum. So the Federal Society has put together a wonderful panel of diverse views on this subject, so I anticipate a lively discussion. What we're going to do is I'm going to have each panelist speak for uh, no more than 10 minutes and with maybe one or two follow-ups. We're gonna open it up for audience questions. I'm, I really want to leave a lot of time because I'm sure that y'all will, will have some things that you will want to ask on this topic of post-Bostock, where do we go policy-wise on gender issues, issues of fairness in sport, uh, the red state, blue state divide in terms of who's, which states are exercising um, police powers in a way that you wouldn't expect a red state to do or a blue state not to do. So it'll be a fascinating discussion. I'll first introduce the panelists. To my immediate left is Professor Andrew Koppelman. He's the John Paul Stevens Professor of Law, Professor by Courtesy of Political Science and Philosophy Department Affiliated Faculty at Northwestern University. He received the Walter Award for Research Excellence from Northwestern, the Hart Dworkin Award in Legal Philosophy from the Association of American Law Schools, and the Edward Corwin Prize from the American Political Science Association. His scholarship focuses on issues at the intersection of law and political philosophy. He's written more than 100 scholarly articles and eight books, most recently Burning Down the House, How Libertarian Philosophy Was Corrupted by Delusion and Greed. Sounds bad. I want to read that. He has a column that appears regularly um, in The Hill, and you can find his recent work at andrewkoppelman.com. Next, we have Christopher Mills. He's the founder of Sparrow Law, LLC. He was previously a partner at a national law firm and a constitutional law fellow at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. He served as a law clerk to Justice Thomas during the October 2018 term and also clerked for then Chief Judge David Sintel on the DC Circuit. He's uh, written briefs and motions in the Supreme Court and at all other levels of courts and has successfully argued in front of the DC Circuit. He's co-counsel currently to Alabama defending its law regarding minors and sex modification procedures and has filed several briefs in other states' cases about the purported medical consensus behind these procedures. He's a 2012 magna cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School, was a senior editor of the Harvard Law Review, an editor of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, and served on the executive board of the Harvard Federalist Society. In 2009, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude with a degree in economics from Furman University. Lives in Charleston, South Carolina with his wife, children, and a golden retriever. Uh, Shannon Mentor, next, is the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, the NCLR, which is one of the nation's leading advocacy organizations for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Mentor was lead counsel for same-sex couples in the landmark California marriage equality case, which held that same-sex couples have the fundamental right to marry and that laws that discriminate based on sexual orientation are inherently discriminatory and subject to the highest level of constitutional scrutiny. Mentor was also NCLR's lead attorney in Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, a US Supreme Court decision upholding student group policies prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, Shannon has won awards too numerous to mention. Uh, I'll just note that in 2005, 
Uh, Shannon was one of 18 people to receive the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Award. Serves on the boards of Faith in America and Transgender Law and Policy Institute. He's previously served on the American Bar Association Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. Uh, Shannon got his JD from Cornell Law School in 1993. Uh, he's, he was originally from Texas, lived away for a while, and is now back living in Texas. And finally, we have Christiana Kiefer, who serves as senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, where she is a key member of the Center for Conscience Initiatives. When she joined ADF in 2012, Kiefer worked to defend the constitutionally protected freedom of churches, religious schools, and Christian ministries to exercise their faith without government interference. Since joining the Center for Conscience Initiatives in 2020, Christiana has worked on groundbreaking cases to protect the right of women and girls to fair athletic competition, including Sewell v. Connecticut Association of Schools. She also works to protect the rights of people of faith to foster and provide loving homes for children in need. Christiana has testified before Congress and successfully advocated at the grassroots level, and as an ADF commentator, she regularly speaks at conferences and comments in television, radio, and print media. She earned her Juris Doctorate in 2010 from the Oak Brook College of Law and Government Policy, where she graduated first in her class. Also in 2010, Christiana completed the ADF Leadership Development Program to become a Blackstone Fellow. So you can see that we've got uh, a panel of very, very noteworthy and distinguished people in this field. So without any further ado, I'll ask Professor Koppelman to, to start us off by giving first some thoughts on uh, how Bostock works or doesn't when it comes to gender issues. Okay. Uh, well, gender identity raises a cluster of distinctive issues. Locker rooms, bathrooms, health insurance, military service, prisons, and homeless shelters. And we oughtn't mush them together. The two most politically salient issues are medical interventions for children and girl sports. They are also distinct questions about what treatments are likely to produce the happiest and best functioning adults haven't got much to do with fairness to athletes and encouraging all children to be physically active. My primary focus today is going to be an issue that cuts across all of them. But first, I've been asked to say something about how Bostock affects these issues. Uh, the Bostock case clearly prohibits discrimination on the basis of trans status because the court held that is sex discrimination prohibited by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Gender is irrelevant to one's qualification for employment. Bostock's implications are less clear in areas where everybody agrees that gender is relevant, such as women's sports. But Bostock does mean that discrimination on the basis of trans status is sex discrimination, which implies that where there's state action, as in public schools, intermediate scrutiny applies. According to Supreme Court decisions dating back to the 1970s, that intermediate scrutiny includes an anti-stereotyping principle. Law may not impose traditional sex roles. The stereotype that trans girls have unfair advantages because their bodies went through male puberty is an overbroad stereotype. Not all trans girls have experienced male puberty. The anti-stereotyping principle is also violated by laws that declare that hormone therapy is permissible only when consistent with one's sex assigned at birth, or that surgery is permissible only to align an intersex child with one's sex. If sex discrimination law means anything, it means that the state may not force people into biographies that the state deems appropriate for their genetic sex. Sponsors of those laws are rightly concerned about adolescents who make irreversible decisions that they will later regret. But the bodily changes brought on by puberty are also irreversible and sometimes later regretted. So a blanket ban will generate regrets of its own. That's the very reason why puberty blockers are prescribed for trans teens. The, the sponsors of this legislation don't seem to notice that these children exist and evidently would be happier if they didn't exist. And the desire that a group of innocent people not exist is a familiar political phenomenon, and it creates political opportunities. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, who's one of the foundational theorists of the American right, right noticed this. 
Uh, a free society naturally engenders diversity, and this produces a distinctive set of opportunities for political evil. In his classic 1944 book, The Road to Serfdom, Hayek observes, I'm going to quote here, it is easier for people to agree on a negative program, on the hatred of an enemy, than on any positive task. The contrast between the we and the they, the common fight against those outside the group, seems to be an essential ingredient in any creed which will solidly knit together a group for common action. And for politicians, this, again quoting, has the great advantage of leaving them greater freedom of action than almost any positive program. And that is the value of, again quoting him, the enemy, whether he be internal, like the Jew or the Kulak, or external. It's hard to unify opinion in a democracy, but a strategy that sometimes works is to scapegoat a harmless and powerless minority. Trans people are the latest victims of this ugly strategy, whose most successful practitioner is Governor DeSantis of Florida, which has helped him to become the leading non-Trump Republican presidential candidate with a promising political future, even if he doesn't get the nomination this time. Uh, the war on wokeness with respect to trans people has been, in practice, a war on vulnerable people. Uh, he talks a lot about protecting children, but the laws he's signed have also made it difficult or impossible for trans adults to get treatment or even to continue the treatment they've been receiving for years. Uh, the attack on transgender Floridians has focused primarily on schools and state colleges where teachers may no longer use their preferred pronouns in class and must use the bathroom designated for their biological sex as assigned at birth. Trans visitors, including parents and students from other schools, face criminal charges if they use the bathroom on school premises that fits their gender identity, even though those rules place trans people at a greater risk of assault. Uh, the campaign, the, uh, the governor's presidential campaign, reposted a video boasting that he signed, I'm quoting from the ad here, the most extreme slate of anti-trans laws in modern history, which produced some of, again quoting, the harshest, most draconian laws that literally threatened trans existence. The deliberately vague, vigilante-enforced, don't say gay law trans targets trans as well as gay people. DeSantis's press secretary claimed that anyone who opposes that law is, I'm quoting, probably a groomer. And when it was objected that LGBT people were leaving Florida because of these policies, she retweeted the news with an emoji of a hand waving goodbye. Uh, so in short, thousands of people who have lived in Florida all their lives are being terrorized because Republicans needed an issue to mobilize around. Now, there are some reasonable arguments for declining, in some cases, to defer to claims about gender identity. Women and girls don't want to see penises in locker rooms. The body of a biological male can give trans women athletes an advantage. Some issues are just hard and complicated. Biologically male prisoners have committed rapes in women's prisons. But trans women are particularly at risk of sexual assault in men's prisons. Some women don't feel safe in homeless and battered women's shelters where there are biological males in residence. But trans women need refuge as well. These issues demand nuanced and sensitive judgment. But the judgment has to presume that the basic needs of trans people matter. A line has been crossed when you boast that you have threatened people's existence and driven them out of their homes and communities. And nuance is in short supply, particularly with, with respect to the care of children. And this isn't just about DeSantis. I don't want to simply beat on him. Uh, it's a tendency that runs through the Republican Party. That's why, as a smart and successful politician, he's a very smart man, uh, he thinks that pandering to that tendency will help his ambitions. 22 states have now enacted laws like Florida's banning gender-affirming care for minors. The best argument for legal restrictions on such care is that some clinics have improperly rushed transition treatment, and this is unquestionably true. On that ground, many European countries have tightened eligibility requirements and demanded that they take place in a controlled research setting. But the absolute bans are recklessly crude. They ignore ample evidence that those treatments are urgently necessary and have been spectacularly successful for some children. 
the legislators who purport to be protecting those children are oblivious and uh, perhaps indifferent, perhaps even hostile to those children. Not every denial of a transgender claim is a threat to trans existence, but trans people are not wrong to feel that their existence is in question in every such conversation. The politicians who have, have advanced their careers by vilifying their innocent fellow citizens ought to be ashamed of themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. That's a, that's a good segue into uh, Christopher Mills' comments, uh, as, since he focuses a lot of his practice on medical issues involving minors. So, Christopher. Thank you. Before I dive into legal analysis, I want to acknowledge that these are difficult, often emotional issues, especially in the medical cases I'm talking about. We're talking about kids who often have many issues other than any gender dysphoria. The question before states is how best to help these children and treat them with justice and equality under the law as every citizen deserves. The Supreme Court has said that our, quote, our basic concept of the essential dignity and worth of every human being is at the root of any decent system of ordered liberty. I start from that premise. I'm gonna describe a few of the basic claims and then analyze them a bit. So the first type is state laws regulating sex modification procedures on children, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries. The second uh, that I'm just gonna to touch on briefly, policies prohibiting schools from inform informing parents about social transitions, new names, pronouns, and the like. The third are policy basing sports games on biological sex. So the first broad set of claims is substantive due process. In the medical cases, the claim is that the Constitution provides a deeply rooted substantive due process right for parents to access sex modification procedures for their children. Well, there's a few problems here. First, you know, we'll, we'll put aside that substantive due process is perhaps made up as Justice Thomas has explained. Uh, we'll start with the level of generality problem. We go from a general parental right to direct the upbringing of their children, to a right to care for children, to a right to, to direct their medical care, to a right to obtain experimental gender modification drugs that the FDA has not approved for use. It's an extraordinary jump to say that because there's a general parental right to direct the upbringing, that then extends to the right to access these treatments, and it violates the Supreme Court's repeated instructions that substantive due process claims must be defined at a narrow level of generality. Third, there's no reasonable argument that, these, uh, that this right to access experimental drugs, however specifically you want to define it, is deeply rooted in our nation's history and legal traditions. It is not. Just as a right to abortion is not, a right to access these treatments is not. The practical implications are also rather shocking. It would mean that parents can countermand FDA decisions and strict scrutiny applies every time the FDA approves or doesn't approve a drug, or every time a state does anything uh, with drugs. Um, on the other side, parental rights claims come up on, again, some of the policies prohibiting parents from um, finding out what's going on with their child's education or otherwise exposing them to certain curriculum. Uh, I, we don't have time to get too much into these claims. Uh, in my view, they're closer to the core of the parents' right to direct the upbringing of their children, including their education, that the Supreme Court has recognized. Moving on to equal protection. Um, uh, I'm gonna focus on the medical cases. We're talking about puberty blockers, which are given to children starting at ages nine through 11 to block puberty, cross-sex hormones, massive doses of estrogen for males uh, and uh, testosterone for females, often results in infertility, and then surgeries. These drugs are not FDA approved for these uses. This course of a treatment did not appear until the 1990s in the Netherlands. A quick digression on surgeries. They're typically not challenged, probably for PR reasons. But first, they are happening. When you read in the newspaper, surgeries on minors are not happening, they are happening. A two-year partial Reuters investigation of one company's insurance claims found hundreds of surgeries, euphemistically called both top surgeries and bottom surgeries. WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the only organization that puts out standards of care in this area. Their most recent standards, which include a chapter on Unix, but not a chapter on ethics, got rid of age limits. Why? Because surgeons were already performing these surgeries and they, on minors, and they didn't want them to get sued for malpractice. Because of the evidence? No, of course not. 
And why would they need to get rid of it if these surgeries aren't happening on minors? But in, in any event, the basic legal theories would apply, substance due process, equal protection, the same, the same theories would apply. But I don't want you to forget surgeries because I think it's important that you know what we're talking about. When you start a little boy on puberty blockers when he hits puberty and then transition to massive doses of estrogen, he's almost certainly infertile at that point. Moreover, he won't have developed far enough for there to be enough tissue for the surgeons to do a vaginoplasty, which is an, an enormously complicated procedure performed on males to try and make them look like a woman. The result, the surgeon has to pull tissue from other places in the body, typically the colon, with all the complications and issues and uh, a low uh, success rate that you can imagine. Just read what happened to Jazz Jennings. So the first question is the level of scrutiny that applies under equal protection. The rational basis is the default, seems to easily clear that bar. It is at least rational to be concerned about whether children have the capacity to consent to unproven, risky, sterilizing sex modifications procedures when they have no frame of reference for those issues, sexual relations, having children, caring for children. The AAP and many states do not think that children should be able to consent to getting a tattoo. How could they possibly think that children can consent to these courses of treatments? Many states have regulated similar psychosurgical procedures like lobotomies, also once supported by the American medical establishment. <clears throat> Needless to say, these procedures are a bit more permanent and destructive than a tattoo. That's why many European countries are putting strict limits on the procedures. As the professor said, they're limiting their use to formal research protocols, but what's important to note is that in most of these countries, it doesn't appear that these protocols even exist yet. In other words, these are functional bans of the treatments. Why? Because of animus? Because they want to get rid of trans kids' existence? Of course not, because it's not clear that unstudied medications that result in permanent sterility is a good way to help children who cannot possibly understand the ramifications of the treatment and whose identity is still being developed, and especially when there are other ways to help these minors suffering from gender dysphoria, particularly psychosocial therapy. So Sweden says, quote, the risks of these treatments currently outweigh the, the possible benefits. England says the same. France, the same. Denmark, the same. Norway, the same. They found that the puberty blockers stunt growth, weaken bones, and affect brain development. Cross-sex hormones increase cancer and stroke risk and cause sterility. Over 95% of children who start on puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. Combine that with a drastic, unexplained rise in females presenting with gender dysphoria as adolescents, a new patient population that has not been studied in any detail and was not the issue of the initial Dutch studies in the 1990s, which focus on children with gender dysphoria. Add to that the, the fact that under the studies as, that have been conducted, 80 to 90 percent of children with gender incongruence come to identify with their natal sex without interventions. And we have no objective way to identify which kids will persist in uh, cross-gender identification. That means that we don't know whether an intervention is actually going to help or set a child on a path that would be contrary to the identity that would actually develop. The stories of the detransitioners who received these treatments and are now trying to detransition are heartbreaking. Add to that the many stories from around the country, including at the academic centers that supposedly provide the gold standard of care, that kids are getting cross-sex hormones after a single visit with no psychological evaluation at all, or maybe a 30-minute talk with a social worker with minimal mental health tra training. Finally, this is not evidence-based medicine. It is ideology-based medicine. The studies that supposedly support these procedures are jokes, and I mean that. They are littered with fundamental methodological defects. They're drawn from surveys, from trans-affirming websites. They exclude participants who commit suicide while they're on the treatments. They exclude the results of variables that presumably don't show the right change. And worst of all, not a single one of which I'm aware separates patients who receive psychosocial therapy from patients who receive drugs. In other words, none of them is able to distinguish the impact of medical intervention and non-invasive psychological support. The, the plaintiffs in these cases' primary response to all this has been an appeal to authority, the major, major medical organizations, as Judge Brown said, the enlightened ones, of course, only the ones in America, because Europe is not on this side. 
They are relying only on the faulty studies just mentioned. I don't have time to go through everything about WPATH, the Endocrine Society, and the AAP, but they are not telling the truth. Go to my website, sparrow.law slash brief, read the brief, it's devastating. Even WPATH says that because the number of studies about adolescent treatment is still low, quote, a systematic review regarding outcomes of treatments in adolescence is not possible. That's not quite true. It is possible to conduct a review. These treatments just flunk the reviews, as several European countries have found. But the point is that even WPATH doesn't pretend that these treatments are evidence-based. So that these laws pass rational basis seems obvious. So is, does intermediate scrutiny apply? In my view, it makes no difference because for all the same reasons, they would pass heightened scrutiny. They are closely tailored to a compelling government interest in protecting children. And states have broad discretion to regulate health in areas with scientific uncertainty, uh, but we can play the intermediate scrutiny game for a moment. The claim is that intermediate scrutiny applies because the laws discriminate based on sex. At a basic level, this doesn't make much sense. No child can obtain these treatments, regardless of sex. So we can play the Bostock game, change sex and see what happens. Start with puberty blockers. The same drugs are used for males and females. Neither can get them, no discrimination based on sex. Cross-sex hormones, testosterone for females, estrogen for males, simplifying a bit. But there's no sex discrimination here either. Under Dobbs, regulating a sex-based procedure that only one sex can undergo doesn't trigger heightened scrutiny. The same for surgeries. By definition, gender transition procedures to make a female look like a male or vice versa are ones that only one sex can undergo. The plaintiffs will say that, well, boys with puberty issues can receive testosterone, but you won't let girls have it to transition sex. But that's not the same treatment. One treats an endocrine disorder. The other is purportedly for a mental diagnosis. The indications are different. The regimes are different. The goals are different. Is giving a boy with puberty problems testosterone the same as giving testosterone to Lance Armstrong so he can win the Tour de France again? Of course not. So the comparison changes the sex and the treatment because again, the sex is something that only one sex, the, the treatment is something that only one sex can undergo. The consequences of calling this sex discrimination would be absurd. Medical providers are generally subject to federal laws prohibiting sex discrimination and they don't have a heightened scrutiny exception. This issue came up in Title VII and SFFA. Um, so if these laws discriminate based on sex, so does a provider who only gives testic testicular exams to males. So does a provider who will only give estrogen to males for transition purposes. This is ridiculous. They don't discriminate based on sex because neither sex can obtain the treatment. As for gender stereotypes, uh, these classifications regulate medical procedures. They reflect that as a biological matter, males and females have different chromosomes, genitalia, and healthy hormone levels. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly warned against deriding such, quote, basic biological differences as, quote, stereotypes. Justice Ginsburg in the VMI case said, quote, the two sexes are not fungible. If anything, these laws stop medical practitioners from foisting irreversible procedures on minors who do not conform to, gen to sex stereotypes. After all, children are diagnosed with gender dysphoria for failing to conform to sex stereotypes. Thus, the laws merely prohibit treating children with risky treatments based on those stereotypes. So basically, describing different standards of care based on differences in male and female biology as discrimination deprives that word of all meaning. <clears throat> Assuming for a moment that intermediate, intermediate scrutiny does apply, there's an additional question lurking in some of these cases about whether an as-applied intermediate scrutiny claim is cognizable. I don't have time to get into that issue too much, but the problem with as-applied intermediate scrutiny claims is that a law is supposed to be able to pass intermediate scrutiny if it's just not too overbroad. So it can be overbroad. Bringing an as-applied claim suggests that if even one application is, is uh, too broad, then the plaintiff can claim an exemption from a law that would otherwise pass heightened scrutiny, collapsing the difference between intermediate scrutiny and, and strict scrutiny and making them functionally equivalent. So that's a theoretical problem with the as-applied intermediate scrutiny claims. Uh, uh, finally, real quickly, one other related legal question in the sports cases. Uh, in most of the sports cases, the plaintiffs aren't disputing that it's okay to separate boys and girls when they're playing sports. 
The dispute is really about how to define boys and girls. In other words, sports laws obviously discriminate based on sex. Uh, so basically the claim is that the definition of girl is under-inclusive and must include some biological men. Such a claim that the state must expand a protected class to include additional subclasses is probably only subject to rational basis review. It doesn't discriminate, the, the, the definition doesn't discriminate based on sex, and the definition is the only thing being challenged, which would suggest that those cases are only subject to rational basis review, and these laws would easily pass such review because the state's definition mirrors how sex has always been understood, which is biologically. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm sure there's many other issues to talk about, but uh, I'm out of my time, so uh, we'll go on to the next panel. Thank you, Christopher. Yes, we, we can see already that, uh, that gender issues, broadly speaking, encompass so many things that we could have this panel go on for an entire day, at least, I'm sure, and, and not touch on everything. So, um, Shannon Mentor, you've got, I think, a different perspective on the idea of medical treatments, parental notifications, so the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and just thanks for, for having me here. I'm really so grateful to be here. Um, and I'll just say, uh, just as a, as a transgender person, as a transgender man, I'm really grateful to live in a country that protects individual freedom, and I'm grateful to live in a time where we have medical treatments that have been so transformative for me and so many other transgender people and allowed me to uh, have a work, have a career, have a family, and, and be part of my local community and my church and hopefully make a positive contribution to society, and that's, you know, that's, I want those same opportunities to be available uh, to uh, transgender young people, because they, they really need those same opportunities. Uh, and I'm really so glad that we're trying to have some sort of uh, conversation ac across the lines about these issues. We just, there's not much of that going on at the moment, and it's very unfortunate, because these are important issues. I really appreciate uh, Professor Koppelman, you acknowledging, and I just wanna, you know, I do wanna acknowledge it, that something's gone amiss, I think, in, in, uh, in our society with so much focus on such a small group of people, and there has been a kind of a line passed that I think should be of concern uh, to all of us. You know, I think of the quote that Governor Cox from Utah uh, said when he vetoed the sports ban there, Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. Something unusual is going on, and I do think we, we need to pay attention to that. But I wanted to talk more at a, a little bit more of a meta level, and I was really struck by Judge Rogers' uh, remarks, which seem so on point that so often in our history and now, you know, crises, things that are these, you know, unusual, remarkable events, too often end up being the cover for very oppressive policies that have dangerous long-term consequences. And I, I really want us to think about that frame around this issue, because for sure these laws, in my view, do cause a lot of harm to transgender young people and their families, but I think they cause other types of harm as well that are a lot less obvious, but that are very real and concerning they're causing damage to principles and norms that are of great value to everyone, I think, especially uh, to conservative people about the limits of government, about the role of the family. But because these laws target such a tiny group of people, it's a marginalized group of people, most people never met a transgender person, it's a politically unpopular group, they provide a cover for really for breaching boundaries, undermining norms that are, are critical to protect us against government overreach, surveillance, intrusion into families, into individual freedom, privacy, dignity. And I really do think that is most apparent with these laws that Christopher's talking about, the 22 states that have now completely banned all medical care for the treatment of gender dysphoria in minors. And this, again, less than 1% of kids have gender dysphoria, and then we're talking about an even smaller subset of those who have severe enough gender dysphoria to warrant uh, medical intervention. And we're talking about a very small group of kids. What we do know is that for the kids who need this care, it is very effective and helps them. You hear the same stories from parents over and over that their children were suffering, don't want to get out of bed in the morning, are asking, why did God make me this way? And then are able with support and 
medically supervised uh, puberty blockers, and then when it's required, hormone therapy, they're really able, they're, they're indistinguishable from non-transgender kids in terms of their mental health profiles. And here's the remarkable thing. And I, th this is truly remarkable. Right now, we've had seven challenges to these laws. Seven federal district courts all have enjoined these laws after hearing evidence presented by both sides Four of those judges are, were appointed by Republican presidents, three by President Trump, and some, they are some very conservative judges, including the judge in Alabama, who heard all of the evidence, including some of the allegations that Christopher was making, and concluded that the state could not support any of them, that the evidence just was not there. And instead, what that judge found, as well as every other federal district court judge that has listened to parents, to the experts, to the state's experts, has concluded these medications have been around for 40 years. They're used to treat precocious puberty, uh, delayed puberty. They've been used to treat gender dysphoria in minors for 20 years. There's a significant body of research showing the benefits they provide. They're done pursuant to these very conservative protocols developed by uh, the Endocrine Society and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Uh, they're, they're not banned in any other country. Uh, the, the UK is a typical example. The UK had one center treating all of these kids. And yes, it was too many kids and they were cutting corners. What they're now doing is they have multiple regional centers to provide the care. They're not banning the care. They're not restricting the care. That's true uh, across the board. There is, there, other countries are, following the same model already used in pediatric gender clinics in this country. Anyway, uh, this, as I said, the, these, the states have not have had every opportunity, believe me, in front of very open-minded judges willing to hear whatever evidence they have, have been unable to substantiate these claims. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the state of the sort of evidentiary presentations. But in, so those judges have found, yes, there's equal protection violations, but they've also found that these laws do violate parent, the right of parents to make medical decisions for their children. And about that, that's the, what I really wanted to, to, to focus on here. That right for, for parents rather than the government to make decisions about how to raise a child and what medical care to provide to a child, that is literally the oldest fundamental right recognized under our Constitution. It goes in before the Constitution. It's deeply rooted in the common law. It's deeply rooted in our history and traditions. The Supreme Court in 1967 in uh, the Parham case literally held that, that the right at issue is the right to seek and follow medical advice. So it's not untrammeled, it's not a right to experimental drugs, it's a right to seek and follow established medical advice. Of course, it is not absolute if the state can show that a parent is harming a child. Of course, you can override parental rights. A little footnote I wanted to mention, Justice Thomas, of course, doesn't as, uh, recognize any fundamental rights, but he has more than once strongly indicated his strong support for parental rights under the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So uh, I just want to be clear. I think that um, uh, the, the, the doctrinal foundation, whether it's substantive due process or privileges or immunities, doesn't matter. What does very much matter is that in our constitutional system, this is one of the mo not just our constitutional system, our society. I mean, saying that parents don't have a right to make medical decisions for their children runs contrary to the most deeply rooted intuitions of every parent in this country. This is part of what we expect, uh, the, the way the world works um, in our society, that again, it's parents, not the government, making medical decisions for their own children. But the concerning thing is that uh, recently there's two appellate courts, the Sixth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit, have held that that right does not exist. And I want to be clear, they didn't say that the government um, had overcome the fundamental right for parents to make medical decisions for their children. They didn't say, well, in this case there's enough evidence of harm or that these medications aren't sufficiently supported by evidence that we're going to say the state can override this right. They said literally it does not exist that there is no fundamental right for parents to make medical decisions for their own children. I think that is deeply concerning. I'm very concerned that because of the subject matter 
of this, these cases, that it's something that just to be frank, most conservative people in this country don't know much about and are gonna have probably initially a, a negative reaction to, that people are not paying attention to what's being held in these courts. But no matter what you think about this medical care, no matter how you think, what you think about how these decisions should come out, I think a lot of people should be and would be concerned to know that two federal appellate courts now have held that there is no fundamental right, no protected constitutional right of parents rather than the government to make these critical medical decisions for their own children and that, that the government can regulate in that area under rational basis review, which just to state the obvious, if that's true, a state could mandate that parents put their children through these treatments. So I think this is something that warrants uh, a lot more attention than we have been giving it in that, uh, you know, I think about, uh, you know, Justice Jackson's uh, dissent in the Korematsu decision where he said that a, a, a very oppressive and yet popular law, when the court, when the Supreme Court upholds a very oppressive yet popular law, it may not attract a lot of opposition at the time, but that that decision is just lying there like a loaded gun that can be used in many other dangerous contexts. And I think that is really, it's, that is something that we need to take very seriously in looking at these cases and what, uh, the way courts I think are getting off track because they're being distracted by the controversial subject matter and really abandoning principles that are very important to both conservative and non-conservative uh, parents. Uh, I don't, I'm just gonna stop there besides saying a teeny little bit about school policies because I think it looks like on the surface that we have the opposite situation with school policies. Um, I, but I wanted to point out um, that when, when we mandate that schools must immediately report if a, if a student says to a teacher or a school official, hey, I think I may be transgender, that if we adopt rules or policies that say in that circumstance, that teacher has to immediately call up the parents and disclose that, we're really creating an, an exception to the usual rule. Right now, schools do not generally have to tell parents anything about their kids, and they don't. I mean, teachers know all kinds of things about kids. Do you have, Susie has a crush on Billy or things like that, they don't pick the phone up and they don't have a duty to pick the phone up and call the parents and tell them. Schools tell parents when a kid is injured, before they're gonna give a medication to a child, if a child's being bullied or something like that. But these policies literally create a very dangerous exception to the general rule where generally we want to encourage students to be able to talk to teachers and school officials freely. We want to let teachers and school officials use their judgment. Now this is different. Parents should have access to records. Schools shouldn't like change the child's name and pronouns and school records without notifying parents. I'm talking about the adv advocacy of policies that literally require the minute a teacher, a child says anything to a teacher about possibly being transgender, that the teacher has to notify the school. I think that really turns teachers and schools into a big brother in a way that what may appear on the surface to be validating a kind of conservative values, but is really encouraging schools, the government, to play a radically new intrusive role in students' lives and in families' lives. And I'll just, I'm gonna share one quick story and then I'm gonna stop. You know, when I, I grew up in Texas, I uh, had a very difficult time as a young person uh, in high school. Uh, when I came out as a member of the LGBT community, my family had a very hard time accepting it. They were not able to accept it. They just didn't have the information. Uh, the only person in my life who, t who would talk to me was my high school government teacher who was very conservative uh, evangelical Christian who told me straight up in his view it was a sin, but that uh, he was no more sinful than many things he had done. He treated me with kindness and respect. He literally saved my life. And I guarantee you if there had been some policy that the minute I disclosed to him what was going on with me, he had to pick up the phone and call my parents. It would have destroyed my relationship with my parents. It would have destroyed my trust in him. And I likely would not have survived the experience. So I guess I'll just close there by putting in a plea that we all try not to be overly distracted by our immediate reactions and assumptions about these specific issues and that we take the time to develop some critical distance, distance about the underlying principles here and the importance of protecting 
family autonomy, and some degree of individual privacy and liberty and dignity, and that we not turn all of our traditions about the way families and schools operate upside down. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. So Christiana, Christiana, sorry, uh, changing topics just a little bit, your state of the art on issues involving uh, girls and women's sports, the Department of Education's proposed new uh, sports rule. So could you speak to some of those issues for us? Certainly. Well, good afternoon. I have the privilege today of talking with you about an issue that is frequently in the national eye. It was recently under legislative consideration here in the state of Texas and is undoubtedly near and dear to the hearts of many in this room, and that of course is sports. The proliferation of women's sports teams and female athletes in high schools and colleges across the country really are the crowning achievements of Title IX. Yet just 50 years after that landmark legislation passed, government bureaucrats, athletic associations, and activists are changing the rules and changing the laws governing eligibility for female sports teams. You've seen the images and the video footage. Two male athletes in the state of Connecticut won 15 women's state championship titles in girls' high school track, titles that once were held by nine different girls. A young woman on a North Carolina volleyball team suffered a, life, a concussion with lifelong effects because she was on the receiving end of a male's powerful volleyball spike. And perhaps most strikingly, just last year, a 6'4 male with wide shoulders, powerful arms, muscular legs, dove into an Atlanta swimming pool and dominated the female competition, which included female Olympians at the NCAA Women's Swimming and Diving Championships. That same male also exposed his naked body to female athletes in their locker room and without their consent. There are examples of males competing in women's sports in virtually all sports, at all levels of competition, in most states across the United States. But before we dig into the legal analysis, I think we first need to answer the question, why do women's sports exist in the first place? Why don't we lump everyone, male and female, together into the same category and just divide by age or weight class or height? It's because all other things being equal, age, training, fitness level, dedication, access to resources, biological sex is the single largest determiner of athletic performance, and it gives males a clear athletic advantage over females. Women's sports exists to give women and girls fair and safe competition. Males are, generally, bigger, faster, stronger, and taller than females. They have larger hearts, greater lung capacity, denser bones, stronger muscles, greater explosive power, greater higher VO2 max, and more efficient respiration. The list goes on. These, by, way, by the way, are not stereotypes. They are a scientific fact. Biological sex gives males a 10 to 50% performance advantage over comparably fit and trained female athletes. That ranges from about 10% in running and swimming events to about 20% in jumping events. Wanted to make sure that was right. 30% in events involving upper body strength and more than 50% in events involving both upper body strength and speed, like the baseball pitch. By about age 14 or 15, many high school boys, if not most, can beat the fastest female Olympians in a head-to-head -head race. In fact, in one year alone, 275 high school boys beat the lifetime best of world championship sprinter Allison Felix in the 400 meter the most decorated track and field athlete in Olympic history, male or female. But without a protected female category, history wouldn't even record her name. So having a female-only sports category promotes the inclusion of women in the same way that having a para-Olympic category or a featherweight category in weightlifting allows us to celebrate the remarkable achievements of individuals who might otherwise be overlooked if we lumped everyone together. Well, what about testosterone suppression is always the comeback. Does that level the playing field? In short, no. At least 19 peer-reviewed studies make clear that suppressing a male's testosterone does not eliminate his physical advantages. And that makes sense. 
that simply suppressing a hormone isn't going to shrink his larger heart or greater lung capacity or his longer and taller bone structure. Males also create safety concerns in contact sports like basketball, soccer, and volleyball. As much as I hate to say it, females are already more predisposed towards injury in contact sports. For example, they're far more likely to suffer a concussion with, and one with more long-lasting and severe effects, and ACL tears as well. So if you add into that a, a male with a harder kick, a faster run, higher jump, more vigorous push, or a more powerful spike, it puts women and girls at an even greater risk of physical injury. And that's in part why a number of international sporting bodies, including World Rugby, FINA, and World Athletics, have recently reevaluated based on the best and most available science. And they have moved to restrict competition in the female category to female athletes only. Unfortunately, the United States is a little behind the international curve in protecting women's sports. Some states are trying to change that. We now have 23 states that have passed laws to ensure that only females compete in the female category. There are about nine lawsuits across the country currently pending on this topic, and they tend to fall in about three categories. Number one, female athletes who are suing their athletic associations or school districts because they've allowed a male to compete in the girls' category. Number two, lawsuits by male athletes against these states that have passed women's sports laws because they're demanding access to the female sports teams. Or third, lawsuits by state governments against the federal government's reinterpretation of Title IX to include gender identity. I unfortunately don't have time to fully develop all of those lawsuits, but I do want to pull on one common legal thread. In virtually all of these cases, both sides claim that Title IX supports their position. But does it? Title IX prohibits, as you're well aware, discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded education program or activity. Typically, no discrimination on the basis of sex would demand pure sex blindness. But that is not the case in Title IX. Title IX specifically allows for sex-separated sleeping quarters, fraternities and sororities, even father, son, and mother, daughter activities. And almost immediately after Title IX, the statute itself was passed, the precursor to the United States Department of Education passed regulations with congressional approval that specifically allow for sex-separated sports that involve competitive skill or contact, which is virtually all sports. Sex, of course, is not defined in Title IX. And when a term is not defined in Title IX, Con Law 101, the Supreme Court has said that it should be interpreted according to its ordinary public meaning at the time of enactment. And there is really no serious question that at the time Title IX passed, everyone understood sex to mean biological sex, the ordinary division of human beings into male and female, nothing else. And that's underscored by the fact that numerous times throughout the statute and the regulations, they use terms like one sex and the other sex clearly referencing a binary concept, not a multifaceted one. Bostick does not change this analysis. First, Bostick recognizes that sex is a distinct concept from gender identity. It did not conflate the two. It did not redefine sex to include gender identity. Recognize they were distinct. And number two, Bostick's analysis just doesn't work in the context of Title IX because Title IX permits and sometimes requires sex distinctions. Remember that Bostock held that Title VII forbids employers from taking sex into consideration even in part when they make employment decisions. It demands sex blindness. But applying the same reasoning here would mean that Title IX forbids schools from taking sex into consideration even in part when fielding a soccer team or a wrestling team. Bostock would in essence make all sex separated sports teams unlawful, which would spell a death knell for women's sports. Of course, the male athletes in the lawsuits I reference, that's not exactly what they're going for. They don't want to abolish sex-separated sports teams. They want to take advantage of sex-separated sports teams without complying with the rules that make them sex-separated in the first place. So you can certainly argue all you want. I think it should be a legislative debate whether or not sex should be or could be redefined to include gender identity, but you cannot use Bostock to get you there. That, of course, is no barrier to the United States Department of Education. 
Uh, first of all, last summer, it relied heavily on Bostock to, inter to excuse me, issue an interpretation of Title IX that said that it would interpret sex discrimination to include gender identity and transgender status. That action was, of course, challenged by 20 state attorneys general led by the state of Tennessee, and they won a preliminary injunction. The district court found that Bostock was limited to Title VII, at least in the Sixth Circuit, and that the Department of Ed had violated the Administrative Procedures Act by issuing this reinterpretation of federal law without the proper notice and comment process. That case is currently on appeal at the Sixth Circuit, and of course I should note that the state of Texas has recently filed a similar lawsuit. But secondly, the Department of Education also relied heavily on Bostock to promulgate two sets of proposed regulations, challenge, uh, re regulations or regulatory changes to Title IX. Last fall, the department proposed a wide-ranging Title IX rule redefining sex discrimination to include gender identity. And then more recently this spring, the department proposed a new eligibility rule for sports teams that essentially says that schools cannot enforce sex separation unless they're able to prove that it's justified by a, quote, important educational objective for each sport, each level of competition, and each grade which frankly I think offers just a fig leaf of protection for female athletes. No school would want to risk their federal funding and get that analysis wrong. So that means that if these rules are implemented and we expect final rules, initially they were promised in May, then it was October, now we're hearing rumors it could be potentially the end of this year or early next. But if these rules are implemented, we expect schools will be required to allow males onto female sports teams in virtually all cases. Finally, briefly, I just want to underscore that we, if we accept a future in which sex is no longer respected in law and public policy, it impacts far more than just sports. Of course, you've already heard about the impact on vulnerable minors and parental rights, but think too about the young woman who's changing in her locker room who has sexual trauma in her past, the young mom who's seeking safety from her violent partner at a domestic abuse shelter, or the woman who has been imprisoned for her crimes and is literally locked in a cell. These women deserve to know that they are safe in their most vulnerable moments, and they are only in the presence of other women. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, panel. So uh, I'm going to sort of sit back, and before we save time, I, I would like to save at least five minutes for audience questions, but first, I'll give the panel oh, seven or eight minutes maybe to just react to things that you've heard from, from your fellow panelists and uh, have, have kind of a debate. So who would like to start? Well, I think that Hi. Uh, we've got a lot of issues flying around. I think that I'd like to keep the focus on what makes the most sense. Uh, because, I mean, Title IX is, we're presented with a situation that clearly wasn't contemplated by the authors of the statute. And so there's a lot of work that can be done to interpret the statute one way or another way, but, uh, but I really want to look past the statute and try to think about how we can bring about a state of affairs where everybody is okay. And similarly with the constitutional analysis, uh, I mean, we already heard uh, Judge Brown denounce Caroline products. Uh, which gave us minimal scrutiny. And it's the same minimal scrutiny that's available uh, that, uh, that Christopher uh, was relying on. And I'm, just, I'm not going to evaluate the constitutional arguments, but what minimal scrutiny does, what it notoriously, notoriously does, is it validates statutes that are really stupid. You can't defend the statute in Caroline products. It's pure rent-seeking garbage. Uh, on behalf of the milk industry, uh, to what wants to sell kids butterfat. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, Williamson versus Lee Obstacle or Railway Express, uh, you know, they're silly statutes. So I think that you know, wh whatever the level of scrutiny is, it just seems to me to be hard enough work to figure out what kinds of laws make sense. And so I'd like to talk about that and just not talk about Title IX or constitutional scrutiny. Once we figure out what makes sense, then we can figure out how to make that, how to accomplish that within the existing legal regime. Thank you. So, Christopher, your name was invoked. So, uh, would you like to respond? Uh, 
I, I, I'd really like to leave time for questions. So I'll just say briefly, the, the explanation of the substantive due process claim um, that Shannon gave was uh, seek and follow established medical advice. And I just want to be clear that what's going on there is to outsource constitutional interpretation to the positions of the AMA. It's interesting that established medical advice there doesn't refer to what the state has determined is safe for its citizens, but instead what a private interest group whose physicians are self-interested and ideological and who make a lot of money off of very complicated procedures think that the rule should be. That seems to be a very dangerous uh, state of affairs and very different from any sort of deeply rooted right that we would have recognized at the founding. Let's not forget the established medical establishment in this country supported eugenics, lobotomy, said tobacco was good for you, and performed racist medical experimentation. So I don't think we want to outsource the law and say that any time we the people deviate from the AMA, strict scrutiny applies. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to comment before we open up for questions? Oh, lordy, lordy. I don't want to get into relitigating Alabama here, but um, <laughs> just to say, not relying on the medical organizations, relying on the actual evidence, the body of medical science and research. And that's, again, what I just think is pretty telling that when these judges have been presented with the evidence on both sides, uh, I believe what the Judge Burke in Alabama concluded is the state had presented, quote, no evidence to support its allegations. I just I guess I just urge people, take a look at these decisions before you make your mind up about, about this issue. But I just want to echo what Professor Koppelman said. To me, the really urgent thing here, we live in a really diverse country. Transgender people are part of it, and so we're transgender kids, and we've just got to find a way to incorporate and include transgender people, which doesn't require revolutionary change modest accommodations, and I can promise you I, that transgender people just want to be able to be part of this country and to live the same ordinary lives that other people do. And we can do this. I mean, there's a lot of good sports uh, policies that have worked in practice and could work in the future. It doesn't have to be this all or nothing, black or white, either or, like banish transgender people from existence or uh, remake all of uh, you know, sports uh, and other areas of, of life. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to just accommodate transgender people as a very tiny little minority of folks in this country. I think I also want to add, I'm going to agree with Christiana here, uh, the question of how you construct sports programs yeah. so that everybody gets to participate where the uh, cisgender girls are comfortable participating and the transgender girls participating is an area where I think people of goodwill are feeling their way. It seems like exactly the wrong time for a nationwide top-down mandate from the Department of Education. So I don't think, you know, again, as a matter of policy, that it is helpful to get a directive from the Department of Education that is meant to be uh, imposed on the whole country. I mean, you know, some things, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, we know, you know, modern administrative state, you know, there are children's lives being saved by the limits on particulate air pollution issued by the Obama administration. That's the kind of thing where you need a uniform solution. You don't want a competition among the states for who can attract polluting industries. But this, we need, we really need state by state and local experimentation. I would just note, and passing with respect to Professor Carbleman, I do want to talk about Title IX. I think there's a lot to talk about there. But um, I would just add very briefly that I, we think there's a place for everyone to compete in sports. So the question is, where is it most fair? And I think there are a number of different athletic associations that are grappling with that very question, including on the international scene. Um, a number of them, for example, are turning the men's category into an open category. Anybody, for any reason that they choose, can choose to compete in the open category. But I think where we cannot compromise is on protecting the female category. We cannot harm one group of people in our, our attempt to make sure that uh, someone else is able to compete where they prefer. Okay. Well, thank you all, panel. Um, with that, I'm sure that there are questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask Christopher. Oh, wait, you're, you're getting a microphone brought to you. Hang on a sec. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask Christopher for, because you've been dealing with some of these cases, I wanted you to address maybe some of the uh, results of the holdings that Shannon was re referring to with the factual records in those. Could you, could you speak to that? 
Sure. Well, uh, first, as we all know, um, plaintiffs get to pick their forums. Uh, second, um, <clears throat> I think what's telling is on appeal what's happened in some of these cases. As Shannon mentioned, both the 11th Circuit and the 6th Circuit has said, uh, whoa, there's actually no substantive due process right to obtain sex modification procedures for your children, and um, only rational basis that applies. Judge Brasher has an opinion concurring that explains why the law would satisfy heightened scrutiny. Um, judge Burke in Alabama, the district court judge uh, Shannon mentioned, you know, he acknowledged that risks of these treatments include loss of fertility, permanent loss of fertility that a, a, an 11 year old is supposed to be able to consent to. But he, he was convinced by the evidence, uh, again, provided by the self-interested medical associations who sort of compile all the faulty studies together and, and make it look like there's some sort of consensus here. Uh, even as if you go and read their own standards of care, they say, the number of studies and their quality is too low for us to be able to make a conclusion. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would say yes in the district courts uh, with the backing of, again, as Judge Brown said, the enlightened ones. There are plenty of experts who can convince federal district court judges um, that uh, of, of a state of affairs that, in my view, is not accurate. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, we've got two over here. First of all, thank you for coming, especially to uh, Shan Miller and Andrew Koppelman. I, I, I admire your courage for coming into a, a forum where a lot of people are probably going to disagree. Um, I want to ask about whether intermediate scrutiny should apply in this case. Um, so it seems that Bostock you know, was Civil Rights Act um, case particular, and it confined itself to that statute explicitly so. Um, and, but intermediate scrutiny seems that's most appropriate in equal protection context. And there are some cases that suggest those are similar, but others like Washington versus Davis that suggest they're different, that they're not always the same. Um, so why should, uh, why should intermediate scrutiny apply? Why should the equal protection principles be transferred to um, what's more of a, uh, a Civil Rights Act case? I think that question's for me. Uh, so uh, the Equal Protection Clause does not as such prohibit classifications. It just says no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. But it has been interpreted by the Supreme Court to embody an anti-classification principle. So a gender-based classification gets intermediate scrutiny. That's a judicial construct, but it's been around for half a century, uh, and so it's the law that we've got. And uh, whereas Title VII, there is an anti-classification principle that is right there in the language of the statute. So what happens in Bostock is that Justice Gorsuch reads the language of the statute, sees the anti-classification principle, says that discrimination against gay and transgender people is a sex-based classification and therefore prohibited by Title VII. Now, something either is or is not a sex-based classification. What well, you mentioned Washington versus Davis. Washington versus Davis is also relying on an anti-classification interpretation of the 14th Amendment, a law that does not classify on the basis of race, but that has a disparate racial impact, is not subject to heightened scrutiny because it is not a race-based classification. So 14th Amendment law focuses on classification. The court has essentially read the 14th Amendment as if it were Title VII and has turned the 14th Amendment into an anti-classification provision. Now, there's a big literature about whether that's appropriate or not, but that is the law. Uh, so once Bostock says that discrimination against gay and transgender people is sex discrimination, while well, something either is or is not sex discrimination, what uh, the court finds in Bostock is that the employer, in order to implement a policy of discrimination against gay people, has to figure out what sex a person is in order to figure out whether they're gay. It's not enough to know my employee dates women. I have to figure out whether my employee is a woman in order to do that. Well, if the state is going to implement a policy that discriminates against gay people, let's just say, you know, a law like the one in uh, Lawrence versus Texas, we're here in Texas, uh, that uh, specifically prohibits homosexual sex. 
The sex of the perpetrator is one of the elements of the crime that a prosecutor has to prove in order to get a conviction. Unless the prosecutor introduces evidence of the sex of the perpetrator, the defendant is entitled to a directed verdict, as I understand the Texas statute. So that's manifestly a sex-based classification subject to, uh, strict, to heightened scrutiny. Now, I don't think you needed Bostock to know that, but once Bostock has said, yep, it's a sex-based classification, the logic seems to me to readily transfer to the 14th Amendment. Thank you, I, William. I, I was just going to say that Justice Gorsuch, the author of Bostock, said in the Students for Fair Admissions Act uh, that actually Title VI and the Equal Protection Clause are not necessarily coterminous, that they actually might lead to different um, analyses, which makes sense because they have different texts and history, and so I don't think it's as obvious that the uh, you know titles, the other title, Title VII, just translates into uh, equal protection. On, I would just note that under Dobbs, uh, a classification, a uh, there was a, a classification based on sex. The law used the word woman, and the court has repeatedly said that regulations that discriminate based on pregnancy are not. Uh, sex-based uh, discriminate uh, regulation subject to intermediate scrutiny. So I do think there is some complexity here um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the analysis going forward. Okay. I just say in Students for Affirmative Action, Justice Gorsuch and the majority both str agreed and strongly stressed that the definition of race discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause in, in Title VI is exactly the same. The bit where he says Equal Protection Clause in Title VI differ is not in the definition of what constitutes race discrimination, but in under equal protection, race discrimination can be justified if there's a sufficiently compelling reason, and under Title VI it cannot. I mean, that, I believe, was the difference he was alluding to. I don't think that anyone could point to a single Supreme Court decision that has ever held, either in the context of race or sex, that there is a different definition of what constitutes discrimination based on either one of those uh, categories under the Federal Civil Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause. So that would be a very, that's another very concerning aspect of these Sixth Circuit and Eleventh Circuit opinions that to my knowledge, and if I'm wrong, God, let's hear it, uh, it's the first time uh, federal appellate courts have ever held that a statute that literally hinges on sex. I mean, under these statutes, if you want to know whether a child can receive this medication, you must know their sex. It is determinative, is outcome determinative, that notwithstanding that facial express reliance, not just a reference, as women can't get abortions, but sex in this case is literally outcome determinative, that they're going to treat that as though it does not facially discriminate based on sex and therefore it doesn't warrant intermediate scrutiny. Again, I get this is about something that a lot of people don't approve of, but once the court issues an opinion like that, it opens the door to, you know, what, what's next then? What other expressly sex-based statutes are, is the courts going to say, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, we're not going to apply intermediate scrutiny. This is some big changes to our law. These are some very significant changes to longstanding precedent in the context of a politically controversial and socially unpopular group. And I think that's a dangerous combination. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one, one other question. You had a question at the table? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I was going to ask, Shannon characterized the issue of procedures for children as being one of private parental choice. But doesn't that just beg the question about what is medicine? And in the post-Dobbs world, states have been allowed to make the decision that killing a child in utero isn't health care. And for the same reason, can't states make the decision that permanently sterilizing a child isn't therapeutic? No, I don't think so. I think we need to take the court at its word that when it said that adopt, uh, abortion is unique because there is the countervailing issue of, of, a, of a life, uh, I don't think that it would be appropriate to read Dobbs as giving states carte blanche to just redefine what constitutes medical science or medical practice. Um, I think that would be a, a, re a rather extreme reading of that decision and one that puts a lot of power uh, 
in the hands of government officials. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in that world where <laughs> states get to dictate what health care parents can obtain for their, for their children. I mean, this is one of the odd things about these cases is these states agree that this is a serious medical condition that left untreated causes very serious harm. And then the evidence presented is that these are the only effective treatments for children who require them. So the effect of these state laws is to leave parents with unable to access the only effective treatment for a serious medical condition, which is part of why seven federal district court judges, and I don't know about you know, forum shopping. If I were forum shopping, I wouldn't choose to bring cases in Alabama, Arkansas. You know, uh, these are not friendly forums. Uh, but, you know, they, these judges have looked at this evidence, and th that is what the evidence shows. That it's a rare condition. Kids suffer. It's a, it's a subset of kids with gender dysphoria who there's no other effective treatment. When they get this treatment, they really benefit, and their parents should be able to, uh, to, to, to get that care for them. There's just no reason to completely ban it. I'm sorry, just real quickly. I, I, the, the option is not to let them have sterilizing sex modification procedures or don't treat them. That is not the option that is before states. The options are to let kids have access to psychosocial therapy that has been proven to work and will not render them permanently infertile and wait until they're age 18 to be able to give informed consent if they want to engage in these other procedures. There's not a single shred of evidence that psychotherapy can effectively treat severe gender dysphoria. And that's what the judges have heard. And that's what the state can't, there's no studies, there's no evidence of that. If but, they're worried, but every don't research think protocol uses that. psychosocial therapy. So if it doesn't work, why do they give it to all the kids who also get sex modification procedures? And then the studies just pretend that any positive outcome is because of the sex modification procedure, not the therapy. Christopher and I obviously have some serious disagreements. I guess yes. I would just come back. Yes. I would just yes. come back to the principle. I would rather have par loving parents who know their children better than anyone and who will be living with the consequences of that decision. I'd rather have them make that decision than state officials. Okay. Well, th thank you, panel, so very much. Uh, I want to echo the comment that is, it's so wonderful to bring together people from different ideological viewpoints and have a civil conversation about issues like this, which is uh, sorely needed in all sorts of platforms, and I hope we can continue the conversation going forward. So before, uh, before Lisa gives her final remarks, I'd like to ask everybody to applaud the panel.